for the past two and a half months, we have been involved in a, a, a series taking us through a little letter in the New Testament, a uh, letter of Colossians. It, uh, Colossae was a, a city that had a church filled with people very much like us. And so uh, the Apostle Paul was writing a, uh, a letter to them. He, he wrote it to them to encourage them. He wrote it to, to correct them in some things that were going astray. Uh, but basically it was a heart of love from the Apostle Paul to the people he cared about deeply. And so today we wrap it up. And I'd like for you to follow along with me. Uh, if you want to turn in your Bible to, to follow along, you can. But in Colossians chapter 4, but the words should be behind me on the screen. And I'd like to read Colossians 4, verses 10 through 18 as, as we begin. Because uh, we're going to talk about uh, friends today. Friends that are, that are like family. And you'll, you'll hear a lot of different names here in this passage that I'm going to read. And then the Apostle Paul writes, he says, My fellow prisoner Aristarchus sends you his greetings, as does Mark, the cousin of Barnabas. He said, You've received instructions about him, and if he comes to you, welcome him. Uh, Jesus, who is also called Justice, also sends greetings. These are the only Jews among my co-workers for the kingdom of God, and they have proved a comfort to me. Epaphras, who is one of you and a servant of Christ Jesus, sends greetings. He always is wrestling in prayer for you that you may stand firm in all the will of God, mature and fully assured. I vouch for him that he is working hard for you and for those at Laodicea and Hierapolis. Our dear friend Luke, the doctor, and Demas send their greetings. Give my greetings to the brothers and sisters at Laodicea and Nympha and the church in her house. After this letter has been read to you, see that it is also read in the church of the Laodiceans that you in turn read the letter from Laodicea itself. Tell Archippus, uh, see to it that you complete the ministry you have received in the Lord, and I, Paul, write this greeting in my own hand. Remember my chains. Grace be to you. It hasn't been that long ago that uh, one of our sons uh, uh, told us that uh, a friend that had been really one of his best friends for years and years and years was uh, moving to a different part of the country. You know, there was a time moving to a different part, part of the country was really like moving halfway across the world. But, you know, so the world has shrunk a little bit, but, but still, you know, Brian was telling us, he said, you know, Dad, this guy's been my friend for years, and he's one of my best friends, and he's moving back to where he and his wife uh, grew up in another part of the country, a couple thousand miles away. And uh, he said, I just, I just feel sad that there's going to be a void in my life. Has any of us here uh, had that happen where friends have moved away or maybe situations occurred that they used to be close but now they're not uh, or they passed away and that void was there? Uh, I, I think it's, it's true that most of us throughout life have friends that are dear to us, very dear to us. Uh, good luck on following me today with the slides, okay? Uh, good luck on that. Uh, I, I still recall as I'm talking about this, a situation that happened several years ago in another congregation. It was a very mobile uh, city where people were moving in and out every three or four years down the military town, Fayetteville. And it was one Sunday morning, one of the men that uh, he and his family had been part of the church for, oh, three or four years. And we knew when he moved into town that it was going to come a time when he was going to move away. And so uh, we got real close to them, um, just lived a couple blocks away from us. They were active in the church, just a really uh, part of the heart of the church as far as the passion for the kingdom and to see people come to know the Lord. And uh, he, they were going to move on this particular weekend, and they came to church on Sunday morning. And after the choir had sung, which he was a part of, and after we had communion, I stepped up to the pulpit. He stepped to the back door and waved and left. That was his farewell. I stood like this for probably about 10 minutes, trying to get composure. But hopefully you have had people in your life that have touched you. 
And, and so today, what I'd like to do is take a look at this particular passage here and uh, uh, talk about Christian friendship. Because truthfully, Christian friends are people that we have a greater bond with them than just sharing common interests. Uh, we have a bond that's spiritual. We have a bond that is very deep. It's all based in Jesus Christ. And uh, probably one of the saddest words in our language is the word loneliness, where people feel like they have no friends. Back years ago when Sally and I lived in the West Coast, a city of six million people that we lived in, I went to call on a guy one night. He and his wife had been to our church for a couple of times, and his name was George. And I went to visit George, sat around his table, and we talked a while, and he said, I don't have a friend at all. I thought, we're surrounded by six million people, and you have no friends at all? And so, you know, here was a man that was extremely lonely, extremely sad. But God created us to be social beings. God created us to have, there would be a void in our heart if we didn't have friends. You take a look at the life of Jesus. I mean, he had good friends. Now, of course, we read situations, we had hundreds of people, thousands of people following him, but also he had this group of 12 that were his, his friends, his close friends. But even in that group of 12, there were three that we would call his intimate friends. Peter, James, and John, they were intimate friends. And then you read there's another family, uh, brothers and sisters. There was Mary, Martha, and Lazarus, that they were very close friends of Jesus as well. Even the Son of God, when he came to earth in flesh, he had, had friends. And we have friendships on different level, different levels with people. There's the casual friends that, you know, we know them by name, and we get together once in a while and enjoy them. And then there are people who are, who are really close friends that we feel very comfortable with and we enjoy being with them, but then there are the intimate friends. And uh, we, usually we don't have many of those. They are few and far between. And if you get a, a close friend that is intimate friend, I mean that uh, they, they know all about you, everything about you, and love you anyway, hang on to them. And you, you share hearts, you share goals, and, and we just don't have many intimate friends. And here the Apostle Paul lists several friends, and we might read through that and think, okay, there's a boring list of friends. Well, let me, just, let me just tell you this. The scripture was given word by word by God to the author, and he penned them. Even though he wrote the words in his own personality, God inspired these words, and so God gave us these words. And I want us to take a look at the stories behind these names today and see if there are some lessons there about friendship that we can apply to our own life and, and not only evaluate our friends, but ask, am I this kind of friend? and evaluate how, what kind of people we are as far as being close friends together. And, and the first thing I want us to look at really is that uh, friends who are friends like family, there is a sense of loyalty. In Colossians 4 verse 10, I read it a minute ago, Paul wrote this, he said, my fellow prisoner Aristarchus sends you his greetings. Now Aristarchus was a man and a friend who stuck with Paul through the tough times. Uh, you have a friend like that? Have you ever had a friend like that? When things are tough, they stick with you. And uh, there are several references to Aristarchus in the scripture. And all of these times, he is right by Paul during, during those difficult times. I did not anticipate this this morning, but uh, I hope you get the sense that I'm, I'm preaching this from my heart because this is important to us. But Aristarchus was a man that was with Jesus, with, was with Paul, even in tough times. And in Acts chapter 19, we read a story, and you can read that at another time, where Paul had gone to preach the gospel, and many people were, were giving their life to the Lord, and those, there were people who hated Christianity. And they rejected it. And they started a riot. And so they started searching for Paul. They couldn't find him, but they found Aristarchus. And so they took him into custody and they were screaming for Paul's blood. And, and no doubt, it was a frightening time for Aristarchus, but he did not betray Paul. He did not betray Jesus Christ. And then in Acts 27, there's a situation where Paul had been arrested because he was sharing his faith. 
and he was being mistreated as a prisoner. He appealed to the Roman authorities. He said, hey, wait a minute, guys. I'm a Roman citizen. You can't treat me this way. I, I appeal to Caesar. And so he said, okay, we'll send you to Rome. And so as they sent him to Rome, put him on a ship, Aristarchus went with him. There was the shipwreck. There was the abandonment. There was all of that. And now Paul says, my fellow prisoner, my good friend, he has been by my side the whole way. And uh, hopefully we can all be a loyal friend to somebody. Even if that's the only thing that you can offer to a friendship, we can all offer loyalty. In, in the book of Proverbs, there are at least three characteristics of loyal friends. Let me just mention them quickly. And I think there's some lessons here that could be helpful to us. The first one would be a, a consistent def defense before other people. And here's, here's what I mean. Proverbs 17, 17 says this, that a friend loves at all times and a brother is born for a time of adversity. Uh, none of us want a fair weather friend. None of us want to be a fair weather friend where when times are good and to our face, we'll talk nicely, but when you're not around behind your back, stab you in the back, man, and we, there have been times of pain and disillusionment, but a friend is one who loves you at all times and knows everything about you, but still stands firm and is loyal to you. But there's another uh, characteristic of a loyal friend, and that is this, there is a wise restraint of intimate knowledge. And by that, it basically is very simple. When people know us, and they know us well, they know our faults, they know our strengths, and they don't monopol or don't talk a majority of the time about our weaknesses because they're our, our close friends. Proverbs 16, 26 says, a perverse person stirs up gossip, and a gossip separates close friends. You've probably heard this story. I, I don't know if it's a preacher's story or not. I don't know if it's a true story or not, but it's, it's a story that I think it illustrates the point. There was a church that was talking to the men of the church that said, hey guys, we need as men to have other men that we can share with and we can be close friends. And so how about just, we'll leave it up to you on your own, own initiative, start a small sharing group where you guys can get together and you can pray. And so these four guys, they, they sort of knew one another and thought, you know, we might make a good sharing group. And so they, they, they got together. The first time they, they met, uh, they introduced themselves a little bit more, told a little bit more about their family, the jobs and things like that. And, and then they, one of them said, well, you know, scripture says, confess our faults to one another. So if we're gonna do, be good friends, let's do that. And so one of them said, okay, I'll start. He said, uh, I've been with my company for several years and I've never told this to anybody, <laughs> but I have been in such a position that I have been tempted and I have embezzled from my company and, and I've never told anybody about it. I've stopped, I feel real bad that I did that, but I just feel like I need to confess that to you. The second guy spoke up and he said, well, I, I tell you for me, he said, I've also yielded to temptation. I've looked at material, I've read material and, and viewed material that I, I shouldn't have viewed that was uh, X-rated and I shouldn't have, have done that. And I just want to pour that out to you that, that you could pray for me in that, that I could overcome that. And the third fellow spoke up and said, well, uh, over the years, I've tried to keep this a secret. You you probably don't know about it, not many people do, but I have a drinking addiction problem and, and I just have some real issues with that. And so pray for me on that. And then afterwards there was some silence and the fourth guy spoke up and he said, my greatest weakness is I'm a gossip and I can't <laughs> wait to get out of here. <laughs> yeah, that's not what a loyal friend does. You'd heard that before, hadn't you? You were there long before I was okay. But a friend knows, a good friend knows when to keep their mouth shut about you because they're loyal to you. I've, I've had a good, several good friends over the years, still have several good friends. Uh, they know my weaknesses, I know theirs. There's sometimes when they come up in conversation and there's one a good friend, very good friend of mine, well, he just smiles and just nods, yeah, yeah buddy, you're right, that, that is, and we go on. And, but that's okay, we love one another as brothers and as, and as good friends. And so there is that where there's wise restraint, of, of knowledge about one another. And then the third one here is it provides, uh, there's tactful rebuke for spiritual blind spots. Proverbs 27 says this, wounds from a friend can be trusted, 
but an enemy multiplies kisses. What that's saying is that if somebody comes to you and confronts you, that's a friend, count that a blessing. Several years ago in another congregation that I was serving, uh, one of our members came to me one day and wanted to talk, came in and closed the office door and they said, I am really upset. You know, life is tough as it is, but so-and-so here, you know, uh, well, she wasn't with us, but so-and-so, she was, uh, uh, was a good friend of mine, and I can't believe this week she came to me and said that she saw something that I had done, and she rebuked me on that, and she corrected me on that, and I, and I just couldn't believe that she did that. I don't need that in my life right now, because life is tough. And she just went on and on and on about how this friend had offended her and hurt her. And as she was talking, this verse that we just read came to my mind that faithful are the wounds of a friend. And, and a wound can, can talk to us and give us some words that we really need to hear. And as she com continued to complain about this friend, I, I thought, okay, <laughs> She didn't like when this friend corrected her. I'm gonna to have to correct her here in just a minute. And so I told her, I said, I'd like to encourage you to look at it from a different perspective. You need to thank God for that friend. Because how many people are there that would lie to your face, but here's a friend who loves you enough to tell you the truth about what they saw. She didn't really wanna hear that. Uh, we prayed together, she left, and later on she told me, you know, that verse made a major difference in the friendship she had with her friend. And I had to learn that. I really had to learn that because I used to think that I can't confront somebody. I mean, I care too much for them. Then I came to realize that if I needed to talk to a close friend, somebody I consider to be a close friend, and I needed to tell them something that might hurt them, if I didn't tell them, then I really did not love that person. Because if you care enough, you will confront them. Does that make sense to you? And if you don't tell them, that means you really don't love them as much as you tell them you do. And you really don't love them as much as you think you do. So there is such a thing as caring enough to confront. Uh, and, and so that's what this, this passage is about here, that there is a tactful rebuke for our spiritual blind spots, and we all have blind spots. Uh, Galatians chapter 6, verse 1, we're told that if we see a brother or sister uh, in, in a sinful situation, to go to them and correct them, but he says, do so gently. And so it all depends on our attitude. I like this definition that I found here recently, and it talks about tact. It says, tact is the ability to make your point without making an enemy. Hmm. You know, we might need to digest that. How can I make the point with somebody and not, not make an enemy, you know, out of them? And, and uh, uh, we all have blind spots in our life that we need somebody to guide us in. So thank God for good friends. Proverbs 28, 23, it says, whoever rebukes a person will in the end gain favor rather than one who has a flattering tongue. Uh, there are some people that will be flatter, 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 one right after another, but uh, they, they don't go deep with you. And we're told here in the Word, let's make sure that if somebody cares enough to correct us, rebuke us, talk deeply with us, you know, thank God for them. I mean, let's move on. Not only are there uh, loyal friends, but there are unselfish friends. There needs to be a spirit of unselfishness, and we see that in some of the people here. For example, there's a man by the name of Epaphras. Here's what Paul said about him. He is always wrestling in prayer for you. Now, let's be honest. There are a lot of times we will wrestle about issues in our own life, but how often do we wrestle over issues in the lives of other people? And here Paul says, he cares enough for you that he takes you before God and he's wrestling with God in your behalf for the things that you are, are facing. He says in Colossians 4.13, he is working hard for you. So Epaphras is a man who loves them and prays for them and wrestles about their situation. But he also mentions a guy by the name of Luke. Luke in, in verse 14, he says, our dear friend Luke, the doctor. Luke was a physician. 
And he apparently traveled with the Apostle Paul, and I guess you could call him his personal doctor, personal physician. And Luke very easily could have remained in his city. He could have remained there uh, and developed you know, quite a, a business there, quite a, um, uh, quite a practice, but he did not do that. Instead, being unselfish, he devoted himself to the Apostle Paul. And a spirit of unselfishness makes for good friends, makes for good friendship. And let me just give you a couple side thoughts here. If, if you are unselfish with your friendship with somebody, you don't get jealous when they become friends with somebody else. Make sense? If you are unselfish, you don't demand that uh, you are their only friend. You don't demand that you only get your way. And so there is that spirit of unselfishness. But there's also a spirit of unforgiving. And a, and a good friend, a friend that's like family, is one who is, excuse me, who is forgiving. I, I said unforgiving, but one who is, is forgiving. And he mentions a young man by the name of Mark. Uh, do you know much about Mark in the New Testament? Let me give you a little bit of background about him. He says here that Mark was Barnabas' cousin, and uh, Barnabas traveled with the Apostle Paul on several of his missionary journeys. Um, he went on the first one, and now they went on the second one. It was the second one. Barnabas brought his cousin, Mark, with him. And about halfway through the, this trip, where Paul was touching bases with the churches that he had started, and not only touching bases, but starting new churches as well. And about halfway through this journey, Mark, this young man, Mark, told Barnabas, I want to go home. We don't know if he was homesick. We don't know if he was missing his girlfriend. We don't know what the deal was, but he said, I want to go home. And so he left. This really made Paul angry. He said, wait a minute, I'm not, I'm not carrying out Holy Land tours here. You know, I, I'm not just doing a Mediterranean cruise. He said, what we're doing, this is a difficult, dangerous mission work, and he's cashing it in and abandoning us. We, had, we were counting on him. Why did he leave? Well, uh, time passed, and the second journey that Paul was on ended, and sometime later he wanted to go again, and Barnabas, of course, was gonna go with him, and Barnabas said, hey, Paul, I'd like to take again my cousin Mark. Paul said, no way, ain't happening. I mean, he, he abandoned us before. We need people we can count on, and Mark's not going. And the Bible tells us that, that Paul and Barnabas had such dissension between them that they parted company and, and never really worked together again. Who was right? Who was right? Was Paul right? Or was Barnabas right? Now, think about it. Paul was concerned about the work. He was concerned about the kingdom. He was concerned about the body of Christ growing and reaching people who were lost. And let me just say this, people who are lost and far away from God, genuinely, they live in darkness. They are lost and they will be lost for eternity if they continue on their own way. Paul was concerned about the work. Barnabas, on the other hand, not only concerned about the work, but he was concerned about this young man who was a worker. And a servant. So who was right? The one concerned about the worker, the one concerned about the worker. Barnabas wanted to see this man grow and mature and become a faithful servant, a faithful minister, a man who had some courage and some stamina. And Barnabas wanted to pour his life into him. And Paul said, no way, he's not going. Who was right? I think they both were. Both were. They came to opposite conclusions, but they both were right. One concerned about the work, one concerned about the worker, and they were both both right. And there are a couple of verses in the scripture that I think they're rather interesting. For example, Philemon, verse 24. There's only one chapter in Philemon, so it's verse 24. And Paul writes this. He said, we, we send our greetings, and so does Mark, Aristarchus, and Luke, my fellow workers. He was saying, now Mark was one of his fellow workers. Ooh, I wonder how that happened. And, and then in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 11, you know, Paul is writing instructions to Timothy, and he says, hey, when you come to see me, here's what he says, get Mark and bring him with you because he is helpful to me in my ministry. Who made him helpful? It wasn't Paul. 
It was Barnabas. Came up alongside of young Mark and encouraged him. I don't know if there's, if there's ever been a time when you have been discouraged, you wanted to throw in the towel, you wanted to walk away. Thank God for people who are like Barnabas that come alongside of us when we are down and keep us going and keep us moving, moving ahead. So that's, that's what happened there. And if you want to be a good friend, forgiveness is gonna have to be something that is a part of who you are. Um, even Christian friends are imperfect. You ever notice that? You ever notice that? Come on, help me. Yeah, we, we are imperfect. That's what grace is all about. We don't claim to be perfect. Hopefully, we take the grace of God and live such a life that we extend grace to other people. But uh, Christian friends, well, we, we're, we're not perfect. And the best way to maintain a friendship is to overlook the weaknesses and go on with it. Proverbs 17, verse 9 says, He who covers over an offense promotes love, but whoever repeats the matter separates close friends. If you want to lose a friend, talk about their faults. That's what it's saying. Uh, and we've all read 1 Corinthians 13, what we call the love chapter. You know, the love chapter, the love does not keep a record of, of wrongs, doesn't retaliate. If anything, love doesn't demand an apology. Love makes allowances. And we need to do that. I know there's food back there, but I need to do a couple of things here, okay? There are times when there are things that are sort of stuck in our crawl and we can't let go of. And so we have this issue with somebody who's a friend. Biblically speaking, we're told if we have something like that. We need to go to that person one-on-one -on -one and talk it out and work through it. If it's at all possible, we have that responsibility. Too many of us say, oh, I love that person too much. I don't want to mess up what we have. Biblically speaking, we need to go to them in love and talk to them. And we have a responsibility to deal with it. And when you tell this to the person that you're carrying this offense against, they might say, no, I didn't say that. Who told you I said that? Or maybe you might misunderstand their motives. You might misunderstand what they did. And all of a sudden it gets cleared all because we followed the biblical mandate <coughs> to go and to talk to them. So don't let a relationship die because we didn't really love that person like we say that we do. Let's move on here. And also there is a allegiance to Christ. If you're going to have a good friend, a, a friend that's like family, good solid Christian friend, that person needs to have an allegiance to Christ. And Paul mentions here a young man by the name of Demas. Uh, Demas is only mentioned in the New Testament four, maybe five times, and four of them talk about how Demas is a Christian and how he's a servant and a worker. For example, in Colossians 4 here, he says, our dear friend Luke and Demas sends his greetings. And then in Philemon, verse 24, as we read earlier, Paul calls Demas a good friend. And in Colossians 4, uh, he's, he just simply calls him Demas with uh, no recommendation you know, whatsoever, no commendation whatsoever. And, and then in 2 Timothy 4, Paul says this, Demas has deserted me because he loved this world too much. And uh, prior to this time, Demas had worked this by his side. He had been loyal, but now he had gone the other way. And Paul says he loved the world too much. In other words, he had lost his allegiance to Christ. Dear friends, close friends, intimate friends that need to be our best friends are ones that have an allegiance to, to Christ. And that's what we, uh, we need to recognize in, in the scriptures. Now, uh, hopefully you've gotten some stories behind some of the individuals here, and you've seen that Paul's just not talking about boring people who lived 2,000 years ago, but these are real people that had an impact on his life. If we look back over our life, I know there are people, real people, who had an impact upon you. Thank God for the people who care for you. Thank God for the people who open up to you 
and talk to you and share with you and encourage you and motivate you and motivate us. Where would this church be had it not been for people who, who dreamed together, prayed together, worked together, and sometimes disagreed, but yet worked through disagreements to see the church happen 41 years ago? Here's what the scripture says to us, and we'll, we'll close with this. Proverbs 18, 24, it says, there is a friend who sticks closer than a brother, and that's pointing to Jesus Christ. Uh, he is our friend that gave himself up for us, and Jesus wants to not only be our Lord, our Savior, but he wants to be our friend that we can walk hand in hand with him. I pray that every one of us knows that within the body of Christ, we have people who are our friends, and they're friends who are like family, and God wants us all to be a part of his family. And that's who we are when we give our life to Christ and we walk together. By the way, we're not perfect. We're all on the same journey, and our ultimate goal is that God is with us and in us, and we spend eternity with him when, after we take that last breath here on planet Earth. Let's pray together. Father God, thank you for this book. Thank you for this letter. Thank you for this passage where Paul talks to us about people who are, are, are close to him. And he shares with us that there were some who caved in. There are some who walked away. There are some who lost the faith because they looked at the world and, and uh, just started following after the world's ways. And God, may we see that your ways are the true ways. Your ways are the only ways. Your ways are the right ways. And if we want to see abundant life now and eternal life with you forever, that your way is the only way. If there's anyone here today that's never claimed Christ, never made him Lord of their life, I pray that it would happen today. Thank you for reaching down and drawing us to yourself. And I pray all of these things in Christ's name. Amen. We're going to be singing our invitation hymn. It's going to be up here on the screens. Uh, coming home. I'd like to say that uh, some of my best friends are right here in this room. This whole world. I love you people. I uh, look forward to seeing you every week. I was telling people this morning in Sunday school that I feed off of the fellowship that you bring. It's true. So just think about that. Think about your friends and the fellowship uh, that we build and that we live on here in church because of the one night. And that's Jesus Christ. The whole community. Uh, so let's all stand, and we're going to sing coming home. Come on, stand this far.
house. We're doing the Lord's work. We are um, telling people about the Lord in one way or another. We all have our, our talents to do that. And we are trying to do that. I'm going to uh, have a prayer now. I'm going to uh, uh, pray for the food so that uh, when you go in there, you can just start eating. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this wonderful day that we had uh, in your church. We're to thank the Lord for the word that was uh, brought to us today in such a way that it made us thank. Uh, we're thankful, Lord, for friendships. We're thankful for uh, people that we can trust. Lord, we are so thankful today for uh, the 41st anniversary of this church, of your church here at Patrick Springs. Thankful to the ones that have uh, been here uh, for that length of time. There are several. And we're thankful for them. And just now, Lord, we're gonna we're gonna have a, a lunch. Uh, I, Lord, I want to thank you for that. I want to thank you for the hands that's prepared. Uh, I want to thank you, Lord, uh, for all of the provisions and things that you provide for us in this life. The beautiful place we live, uh, the beautiful friends that we have, our loved ones. There's so much to be thankful, Lord, and it's all because of you. And we pray. Your name, Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Amen.